All right, how are we doing out there, Psych 1 students? Hope you guys are doing well. Want to take just a beat here and get us headed in the right direction for exam number two. So I wanted to share the screen with you. So let me go ahead and click on this and talk a little bit about logistics. And so first is the fact that this exam is going to open up on Friday. Friday in the morning, and it is going to be due and closed up on Sunday. So we want to know that that's been in the announcements and you guys should be well aware of that. And then secondly, just technically and mechanically, when you get in there, when you take this, it's as if we're in a class and it's a blue book essay exam. So you're not going to copy and paste an essay into the actual thread area, but rather you're going to type it directly in there. And so we don't want to get where we're, we're copying and pasting it. We have software to know when we do that or if that's done. So we don't, don't do any of that. Just make sure you sit down and you go for it and you write out what you have been working on and studying. There is no time limit. So you guys have plenty of time to be able to take care of that. So again, just to reiterate here is that this exam will open up on Friday and it will be due on Sunday. And then again, no copy or pasting, just go in there, answer the questions, and then we will go from there. And so here we are with exam two. And I'm excited to be able to show you, not show you, but to cultivate a classroom where you have multiple ways of learning and not just multiple choice tests or even a, you know, other fill in the blank type of test. And so I try to really have a wide variety of ways that we can better understand what we've come to learn. And certainly testing is one of the big areas and it really just depends on how we use it. So testing could be a mess, uh, there's no doubt about it. But if, we, if we're studying a certain way and we're really trying to use specific techniques that uh, we've talked a little bit about in here, uh, this is not a study skills class, but there are many techniques to be able to test yourself to really learn about the information. And so if we're doing it the right way, then the research is really clear when it comes to trying to really ascertain, understand and apply information. Testing is a good way of doing it. Now, here we are with an essay type of format. And so if you click on your test two, it's right here. You're not gonna have direct access to it just yet, but you do see the rubric, okay? And it's broken into two parts. And so you guys have it right here. The first part is really just the description. And for full credit here is that you've completely described the actual question or the definition, the concept, the theory, whatever it is that we're working from or with, you are really detailed. And I wanna be really mindful with how I say this because um, I am looking for detail, especially with a test like this where you do not have a time limit You've had a good opportunity to prepare. I've given you the question prompts. And so I will be looking for a lot of detail. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what that should look like here in just a minute. But when in doubt, you know, write it out. And so meaning that you don't wanna just write, write a bunch of stuff, but you wanna write something, explain a theory, whatever it is the question is, and then describe and explain, expand. That's what details are. And then we also talk about examples. And so I'm going to be really looking for that. And so what I'm not looking for is 25 pages. And so I have students that can write two paragraphs and nail it. And so we are looking for a concise written form that you've addressed and in, in, in a very concise way. But thinking that you're going to type a three, four page essay that, that kind of rambles and goes all over the place is definitely not the way to go. And so we're not looking for that. I, so I guess what I'm saying here is, is what we're looking for, what I'm looking for is nothing, I'm not looking for any specific pages, you know, two pages, one pages, a paragraph, I'm looking for accuracy. And, and again, I've been doing this for a while, so I know if you've done the work. I mean, I can know in the first paragraph, the first three sentences, if you've done the work. Right. And so and how do we how do you do that from your end is obviously prepare, but really be concise, get right to it, be descriptive with how you describe what you're saying and show examples and make sure that we elaborate that essentially is the content of this right here. 
25 points for that. And then basically it just starts to go down if maybe you have listed something and you've explained a definition or what a theory is, but you lack the necessary details. Okay, you have not elaborated enough. You have not explained what does it mean? Like, what is it really that you're talking about when it comes to self-determination theory, for example? And then, you know, again, if we just look at this, you have done, um, you have done uh, a below average job in describing. So again, it just goes down levels. And so if there's a lot of lack of detail, I don't know if that makes sense, but if there's lack of detail, then we start to get to minimal credit with that. All right. So this rubric right here cuts right to the content of the question that's being asked and detail. How detailed are you? And then here's a big one is the examples. And I'll show you what this looks like here in just a bit. But this is to be for you to be able to apply an example. And this is how I really know that you know, is that it's really hard to go Google an essay like with some of these questions, because, you know, again, not to say that people are doing that. I'm not a cop or anything. I don't have time to look for all that. But you really need to know your your stuff and your material when you provide a behavioral example of you and that's the next piece here is that i'm looking for these essay questions or these prompts they need to have you need to have ample examples in there you need to have examples and they have to be accurate which means it fits the theory and it needs to be behavioral and it needs to relate to you so way back on our first exam many of you you had points taken off because maybe it wasn't an accurate an example, but for example, a psychodynamic an example of unconscious drives, conflicts, transferences. It didn't really fit what psychodynamic approach is all about. So that's one piece. Another piece is you need to, you need to relay it and align it to you behaviorally. So you need to show me, hey, the other day I did this and this is an example specific example of this theory. So it aligns, it's accurate, and it's detailed. And so anything below that, you, we just start, you know, we take points off based on all the stuff that I've just talked about. So maybe it either, either the example doesn't really fit that perspective or that question I asked, or it's not a behavioral example. What I mean by a behavioral example is that when you list an example, we don't want to just say an, a random ex example of an experiment you heard about or you read about, right? So if you're talking about psychodynamic approach, then we're not going to say that is where the child, you know, did not develop meaningful relationships with the parents. So that is a third party example. We want to, we want you, I want you to be able to delineate a specific example of you. And that's what we'll talk about right now. So again, two parts to these is to these questions that you'll be asked for your essay exam is number one content how detailed are you how much do you well first of all not just detail because you can be really detailed but really miss the mark so number one is how accurate is it in terms of the concept definition or theory and then how detailed is it did you elaborate expand and provide explanation and then secondly the second part is is applied behavioral examples does it align does it fit and is it behavioral and is it related to you so those are the areas. Now let's get to the actual questions here. And so we will have three areas. One is recall, and I'm gonna be brief here. I'm not gonna reteach this because what? Because I've already done that. This is really more of a review, but let's talk about this first. Now with memory, interestingly, we all have exquisite memories. We've learned this already from back in chapter six. The issue is really getting and recalling information material and pulling it out as we know when we take tests, right? So it's really the aim here is to understand that memory with all of us humans is usually exquisite. We have really just phenomenal memory storage. The problem is, is retrieval. And so what we're at, where we're at here with this question is cutting right to the center of retrieval. And so retrieval is essentially pulling information out of storage and what we're really doing here technically is we're taking information, meaning we're recalling it, pulling it out of long-term memory, moving it, moving it into working memory, which is also known as active awareness or consciousness. And that's what retrieval is. And think about if you have a pet or you have a dog and you're, you want them to retrieve a bone. When you throw the bone and they're going to get it and they're bringing it back, that's the retrieval process. 
And so front and center with retrieval is what we cover, is what we, we actually call memory tasks. And that is really what we're going here with this question, it is question number one, it is memory tasks of recall and recognition. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna need to write and talk about specifically in, in a concise way, what recall is and what recognition is. What, what are they and how, how do they differ? And then what are examples, okay? Now, again, I'm not gonna just reteach this and then this is not me giving you the, the actual answers because you have to write this in your own words and you have to apply it specifically to you. But let's start with recall. So recall is a memory task that we use to retrieve information. And we do it to retrieve information without what's called external cues. That is what recall is. And so for example, recall is like an essay test. If you have just a prompt, you have minimal cues. That's the only cue that you really have. And so a cue is an external as well. It could, it could be internal or it could be external, but a cue is a stimulus that elicits something. And so, Recall is where we're using retrieval without external cues. For example, multiple choice, or let me scratch that. Not multiple choice, but an essay type of question where there's not a lot of cues. You have to really just recall and use internal type of cues that you have learned because you've studied, right? So that's an example. Another example here, now, by the way, you cannot use those because that example is in the textbook and you wanna use your own examples and behaviorally how it fits you and your world. So the next example was just me the other day and it was where I was trying to find a key. When I go out for a run and I run a lot, I put my key, I go outside, lock my door and I tie my key. I put my key on my shoelaces and tie them. So anyways, I come back from my run and then the next day I'm trying to find my key and I can't find my key. Right. So what do I do? I have to recall it because I don't have a bunch of keys in front of me. I don't have that key in front of me to distinguish between other keys, which are external cues. The only thing I have is a little, little simple internal cue of, of knowing that I ran the day before. So what do I have to do? I have to retrace my steps, mentally speaking, and I have to use recall. So I thought, you know, I ran yesterday. I usually put my shoes in the garage. I bet you it's tied to my shoes still because I just kicked off my shoes. So I retrace my steps, I go back to the garage and there it is. That's the process of recall. So if I'm typing all that up, I need to be detailed with that. I need to, I need to explain, you know, recall is, be descriptive, be really detailed with what that is in your own words. And then you wanna find and be creative. We all have, uh, we really have hundreds of examples, all of us, you just need to think about them. When was the last time maybe you lost something or maybe you're not going to use that type of example, but you need to use your behavioral example, be concise, make sure it aligns and you're really detailed with that example and make sure it does fit the whole recall concept, which is not using external cues. So that's recall. The next memory task that you're going to be asked, and again, it's right here, number one is recognition. So we have recall and recognition. Recognition is a memory task where we use identification to be able to pull information out. And we use identification with internal type of, it can be either be internal type of cues or external cues. But the fact is here with, with recognition is that there's mostly external cues available. So we have a lot of variety of cues that are available for us. So with recognition, multiple choice. A multiple choice exam is a great example because the answer is right there, you just have to find it. So we call that external cues. There's many cues right there, so you just have to kind of find it in there. So a multiple choice test would work. Here's another example, a behavioral example. Again, I'm trying to find my keys. And again, this is a behavioral example. And this is what you wanna write. I, first person, did this and tie it to and thread it with a nice example that fits that this actual concept of recall and recognition. So I couldn't find my keys. I have a specific spot for my keys that I put them in, but I also have another bowl where we put a lot of, not just keys, we put some other things. So I, I started thinking, okay, I got to retrace my steps. I go back to the bowl 
and I see all these keys because we have keys for all kinds of stuff, right? Cell phones and things. And the fact that all the keys are together in one area, that is called recognition. I'm recognizing. So I saw my key, I pulled it out. It's actually on my key ring that was next to about four other key rings. And so there was a lot of external cues and the one I was looking for was right there. So recognition is where we're recognizing. So we recognize because we're using external cues. Okay, does that make sense? And so uh, the fact of the matter is, is that there, there are other keys around and I went to where there were keys to identify the key that I wanted. So that's another example. Again, multiple choice test is an example of that. So can't, you can't use those examples. You wanna figure out your own type of behavioral examples and be as detailed as you can. The second one here is behavioralism and psychodynamic perspective. You're going to be asked to distinguish, distinguish. You're going to be asked to be able to compare and contrast these two and then also provide examples. So the first thing with a question like that is to be able to compare and contrast is first of all, just write them out. What, what is behavioral perspective? This is from chapter one. And what is psychodynamic perspective? And the reason why I put this question in again is because I also wanted to compare and contrast these two because we really struggled with that. And so I wanna give you another opportunity to really pull apart and understand the information here. So list out what they are and then write examples in a detailed manner as we have already talked about. So briefly here, the behavioral, behavioral perspective is one that suggests that behavior is determined by environment, right? It's observable. We can see it and it's elicited because of the environment. So it's external. And it's usually around these three areas. Number one is we do what we do because of the environment, because probably it has something to do with reinforcement, whether it's pleasure or pain or trying to reinforce a behavior or to stop a behavior. So that's basic instrumental conditioning we talked about already in chapter five. So we do what we do because the environment and it's three areas. One of them is, is reinforcements, instrumental conditioning. Another one is classical conditioning, which is basic conditioning. There, there could be a neutral stimulus in the environment that elicits a response. We talked all about that. Uh, this is how phobias, ta taste aversions come about, fear response. So, so that would be number two. And number three is observational learning, all of which come from the environment. So behavioralist approach is one that says, hey, you know, we do what we do. We can predict, we can explain and describe behavior because the environment plays a role. And those three areas, reinforcement, classical conditioning, observational learning have a hand in that. That's behavioralist approach. And then we need to have an example of that. By the way, you do not wanna re just regurgitate what I just said. You wanna be able to ascertain the information by paraphrasing, and but it has to be concise, right? And to the point, how is it that you come to understand behavioralist approach? And, but it needs to align. So it's not just you know your opinion on it. He needs to align to what it is based on the literature and what's being said. And then we need an example. Here's an example again, and it has to be an example for you and your behavior. But let's say that um, not studying for a test. Let's say, hey, I, I decided to not study. Well, I decided that. And so if I'm going to use a behavioralist approach, it's got to be something from the environment. Well, first of all, the environment is the stimulant. So which is the test? So the test is driving my behavior. I'm not going to study. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the test. The test is external. And I don't, and it's, and it's a big piece of the environment. And in addition to that is when we don't study, we feel better. Okay. This is, this is called, you know, we talk about delayed gratification in other chapters, but the reason why we procrastinate and the reason why hypothetically I wouldn't study is because it feels better. I mean, it doesn't feel good sometimes to study because it takes time. It takes energy. It takes a lot of work mentally. It takes a lot of, a lot of resources in general. And so if I just don't do it, I feel better. That goes back to reinforcement theory, specifically negative reinforcement, because we're taking out an adverse of stimulus that reinforces behavior, right? That promotes behavior. So not going to confuse you with all that, because we did talk about that in chapter five, but essentially it's negative reinforcement. So you see how I explain that? 
that's what you're going to need to do. So if you say, hey, I didn't study, and that's an example of the environment, how is that? You need to be able to pin it back to some kind of uh, concept or approach. In this case, I use learning theory, negative reinforcement that shows not studying is a form of trying to get rid of that pain that comes from just grappling with tough things mentally. And so it's negative reinforcement. So you have to be very detailed and explain your example, explain what it is. And then, so that was behavioralism. Psychodynamic is, and again, so how do we determine behavior? How do we explain, predict behavior? We have seven contemporary approaches plus two classical approaches. Psychodynamic is one that gets right to the unconscious. So we do what we do, not because of the environment, not that, but because of internal conflicts that we have that are unconscious. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is, is it's because of early childhood experience. And so Sigmund Freud uh, really looked at two areas, sex and aggression that drives behavior. And so what happens is, is we do what we do because of these internal conflicts between something over here called biological urges. It could be, you know, emotions, aggression, or more sensory expression or sexual impulse. So it's those that are in conflict with societal demands. You know, I can't go on the playground and just punch a kid if I'm a child. Can't do that. But Freud theorized that we all have those urges, but we have a conflict because society, as we get older, we know we can't just go punch a kid. So we have to kind of suppress that. And then he also used other terms. One of them was not suppression, but actual repression, where we, where it's called motivated forgetting, where we're trying to pull that and push that out of awareness back into the unconscious. And so fundamentally, you need to be, be able to explain that psychodynamic approach how does it differ from behavioralism? Well, first of all, what it is, is it, it's the unconscious that drives behavior because of early childhood experiences, biological urges versus societal demands. So that's what it is. And then it differs. It differs from behavioralism because it's not the environment. Now, you also need to compare. So this question right here is compare and contrast. They do compare in that the environment drives some of it. Okay, you see that? So psychodynamic perspective also looks at childhood. And so if you're in an environment, which is, you know, your, your parents or caregivers, that is the environment. So you have to explain the fact that this theory looks at early childhood that also relates to behavioralism. However, it is different because it's the unconscious that's driving behavior. And a lot of us really mix this up with our first test, with, with our examples. So our examples are psychodynamic. They're not related to the environment. That's where we're gonna really know when to pull it apart and to compare it, okay? So psychodynamic is similar to behavioralism in that early childhood and environment plays a bit of a role with that. However, Sigmund Freud theorized that it's not the environment at all, really. It's really the unconscious drives. So. To be a critical thinker, you need to be able to see the connection between the environment, but understand that it's not the environment that's pulling the triggers, it's really the unconscious drives, okay? And so an example here would be, well, let's say not studying again. So, well, how is it that unconsciously we do that? Well, we would have to make our case here and say that there's got to be something that it's a pleasure, pain kind of principle unconsciously that we're trying to pull away. From. And so what we would look at here is that, you know, I don't want to study because I think I got this. I'm going to get an A on test. This is easy, right? So what does that mean? Well, that's denial, you know, that's denial. So a big part of unconscious conflicts with Freud is all about this right here. It's about trying to reduce anxiety. So your example needs to be driven by an unconscious component or, or construct. And I just listed one, there's a denial, could be rationalization, uh, could be telling yourself something at an unconscious level uh, because maybe it's too hard. There's too much anxiety there. It takes too much effort. So you need to be able to explain that. Now, let me tell you, if you want to, you know, really learn more, go to chapter 10 and look at defensive mechanisms. You're going to look at repression, denial, rationalization, reaction formation, on and on, transference. 
you're going to look at a lot of things that'll give you more context, more examples. But again, we don't need to work ahead. Well, I'm not asking you to go, you know, to be, you know, 100% versed in the id, the ego, the super ego. We haven't gotten there just yet. That's in our personality chapter. But, but rather, you need to be able to describe the unconscious childhood, sex and aggression, and then tie an example to that unconsciously something that's reducing the anxiety. That's what we need to do and be detailed with that. All right, finally, the last thing here is self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is one that builds from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which suggests that we need to have basic needs that come from physiological needs, then needs of safety, then self-esteem, then we're able to get to where we call expression of self-actualization potential. So what happens though, when we have those needs, man, and that's where DC and Ryan come in with self-determination theory. And they suggest that our motivations are, do not stem just from deficiency, but rather they're already innate in us. We have specific psychological organismic needs, which means we the organism already have them in us. They just need to be able to come out. That actually drives behavior. Okay, and so they are, one of them is competence, then we have autonomy, and then we have relatedness. Competence comes back to self-efficacy theory, which means, again, you have a sense that you're able to complete something successfully. That is competence based on DC and Ryan. You have a sense, and I say sense, but it's really perception in the literature that you can get things done, you can be successful, and there's an expectation maybe that you can be successful with certain things and that you're getting better. That's competence. And again, you're gonna have to paraphrase and pull that apart and get ready for that. And then another one is autonomy. And that is where you're in the driver's seat. You have control. It's not the environment. Remember how we just talked about the behavioralist approach? Well, this flies right against it. This is about you. This is about us, free will, being in the driver's seat, being in control. It's not you. It's not that you have, you have to do something, but you decided to do it. Okay. And then you need to have an example there. And then the last one is relatedness. This one's pretty intuitive, right? It's meaningful, warm relationships. And so competence, an example is, was, well, you can pivot and go back to psychology. I've learned so much in psychology with a specific example. How is it that you learn? How is it that you sense or perceive that you have accomplished something? That's competence. So you have to be able to tie that in. Autonomy is you would have to show an example of you being able to do something. Let me go back on that. You need to show an example of you making the decision yourself that you want to do it. Here's an example right here that I think I, I talked about in one of the lectures is that when I was interviewing for a job, I, I, I actually came out in an interview and said, look, they asked me, why do you even want to be here? I say, well, first and foremost, I don't have to be here. I want to be here. And that is autonomy right there. So I do, I, I'm in the driver's seat, I'm in control. And so you have to be able to provide an example that motivates you. Okay, again, self-determination theory is about motivation and intrinsic motivation, not external, not the environment. Intrinsic motivation is you do what you do because of its own sake, because you enjoy it, you're interested in it. Um, and again, like it's just something that's who you are. You're curious about it. It's internal. So we have competence, autonomy, and then relatedness you would explain that relatedness is a part of being connected to a group or individuals that elicit this, this warm relationship. And your example would have to point to the fact that it increases your intrinsic motivation. With all the examples with self-determination theory, they need to be aligned by showing that it has increased your intrinsic motivation, your interest, your love, your joy towards it that increases that motivation in general. And again, motivation is, is the direction and intensity of behavior, okay? All right, so I think that's it. My dog's going crazy now, and that should give you just enough to be able to review. This is a review. You've already studied, right? So now it's just kind of tying up loose ends and pulling this stuff together, okay? I think I have everything, and there's reasons why I have selected these three questions because 
this is kind of where we're at in this class. And it's also some, some areas where I think we need a little bit more work. If you have any questions, reach out to me and I will see you guys soon. Take care now.